Hi, it's Kirby Summers, and I welcome you to the Epstein Project podcast. I want to thank you for um, your continuing support, uh, becoming members of the Epstein Project newsletter, which so many of you uh, send me great feedback on. You basically love it, and I love that you love it. Um, and for your help on Patreon, or I should call it Patreon, right? <laughs> And all of you who just, you know, who buy my books and keep buying my books and keep waiting for my new one. In fact, my new one, uh, Creating Epstein, uh, with the subtitle, Bill Barr, Leslie Wexner, and the CIA is almost finished. Today, and by the way, like this video, please like the video, subscribe. Um, today, I'm going to share with you uh, one of the chapters uh, which I sent out to my Epstein Project newsletter subscribers. So if you have not subscribed to the paid newsletter, uh, which is really where I do my deep dives and where uh, real news is shared as opposed to you know mainstream media uh, nonsense uh, that really doesn't give you any information but superficial um, a fluff that is, you know, is is kind of doled out by PR departments that are paid by the people who put the news there. So if you want real information, I have been doing uh, the newsletter now for three years. And so this is one of the chapters and I'm going to try to get through to a lot of, of the new threads that I was able to uncover uh, that sort of explain who Leslie Wexner is. Because I think that the general public looks at Leslie Wexner as, oh, there's this older man. And I think still a lot of people are under the false impression that he was, quote, taken advantage of by Jeffrey Epstein. That's never been a position that I have held. And I think most of my followers uh, believe this not to be the case. In fact, I propose, and I have always proposed, that um, Wexner has been um, uh, sort of a funnel through which the intelligence agencies, I'm going to say plural in this case, um, use a person a company with a lot of money, which they have historically done so that they can obscure their role and their connection with the end product, in this case, Jeffrey Epstein and the trafficking ring that he ran on behest of the covert government. But that it's actually the money of the um, organization, say like the CIA, the Mossad, which is then funneled through someone like Leslie Wexner, who was, uh, you'll see from the information I'm going to share with you today, connected to the government from very early on. And this information has not been shared with the public in any way, shape or form. Um, and um, so there, there isn't a lot of information on Wexner's early days and not even in Ohio, uh, do many people know a lot about him? You know, he has always uh, been secretive other than the articles that he paid for. Uh, let's say in the New York Times in 1985, they did a big spread on him. That was a, that was a fluff piece. Um, so today, this is not a fluff piece. <laughs> This is uh, information that took a long time to uncover. And so I'm just gonna go in here and, and start. And again, I may not finish everything. So I encourage you to please become a member of the Epstein Project newsletter. And also that this information is in my new book, Creating Epstein, uh, which I'm gonna be releasing in, in less than two weeks. I'm, I'm, I'm very close to finishing the book. And, and the book is fabulous because it shows um, the first part is, is a collection of different covert operations undertaken by the CIA. And I do have one example of the FBI. Um, 
And also uh, Doug Valentine, which we all love, um, he has a chapter in the first part of the book and it, it, it explains some of these covert operations from the point of view of the agent who was assigned and who became a whistleblower. So whistleblowers always have the most amazing inside information, you know, stuff you will never find in CIA records or in historic, like books that are theoretically supposed to be of history. And after that, uh, there's a section where it's literally the creation of Jeffrey Epstein and how he came to be, what the steps were. And then after that, I go into the life of Leslie Wexner, his parents. And then after that, I, I delve into uh, the Barr family and, and um, their role generationally in the making of Jeffrey Epstein. So this is just a small uh, piece of a very ph phenomenal book. I love my book and I can't wait for you to read it. So I'm gonna, you know, without further explanation, I'm gonna just dive in here. Uh, Meyer Lewis Wexner, who was born in 1900 and died in 1966, li lived a life of crime. He earned his living as a truck driver for Chicago and Northwestern Transportation and as a thief. From all accounts, he was a womanizer and had a drinking problem. He married three times and had 10 children. His wives all died eerily early. Unlike some members of his family who settled in Ohio, Meyer moved into mob infested Chicago. In the 1920s, Giovanni Papa Johnny Torrio ran the Chicago Mafia using prostitution to build an illegal liquor empire. Torrio grew up in New York City's Lower East Side. He went to work for his stepfather who owned a grocery store, which was in reality an illegal liquor front. It was here that young Torrio was introduced to crime. He then moved to Chicago where he took over what was known as the outfit working with Al Capone, who became the most infamous mobster in American history. Torrio and Capone were part of a little known but powerful organization, Union Siciliano, which was the Chicago mobsters version of Yale's Skull and Bones Secret Society. They influenced the vote in the United States and members were issued annual passwords. They took part in rituals that included code words, tokens, signs. A lot of this information was zealously guarded. Um, it was a politically connected organization where they had direct access to the power brokers in Washington, DC. And in turn, uh, the DC politicians, including the presidents and the head of the FBI, um, protected the bootleggers. So the Brofman family emigrated from Canada uh, to Canada from Russia in the 1880s. And they were given the franchise on British liquor. At the time, all of the liquor that was flowing into Canada and into the United States came from Britain. In uh, 1918, at the start of prohibition, they began using a loophole, permitting them to distribute alcohol uh, through pharmacists for medicinal purposes. And so what they did was they put labels like Rockabye Cough Cure on their whiskey, and they cut deals with the heads of the Cosa Nostra in the United States making a fortune. This included the Torrio and Capone franchise in Chicago. Uh, over a half a century later, the second and third generation of Brofmans became entrenched, as you already probably know, in the life of Jeffrey Epstein. So in the book, I, I do have old documents I was able to find uh, that you'll see uh, in the book, you know, including addresses. And what I found interesting is that a lot of the addresses that I found connected to uh, Leslie Wexner's um, family, the homes were raised. In some cases, the streets were completely renamed or gone and there was a vacant parking lot. So it seemed to me, and I didn't do this for every uh, member of the family, but the few that I selected to look at closely, I, I just found it very bizarre that um, the houses were gone, 
the streets were gone and there was just a parking lot. You know, it's, it happened more than once. So it, it occurred to me that someone methodically went back and, and like with a pencil eraser, got rid of these, these locations. And, and it, you know, of course, that person would be Leslie Wexner, who, who has the, the means and the, the financial means and the ability to get something like that done. So Meyer Lewis Wexner was arrested for grand larceny in 1936 and jailed. By 1954, when he was arrested in San Francisco, California, for the same charge, court records show he had two prior felony convictions for which he was imprisoned in other states. And again, you know, I include an image of the 1954 uh, offense. Um, and Meyer Lewis Wexner is Leslie Wexner's uncle via his father, Harry. Now, Harry was born in 1899, making him one year older than Meyer, and he died in 1975. When I looked for the obituary of Harry Wexner, there was none, which is odd. Uh, you know, it's he was the chairman of the limited, and he was Leslie Wexner's father. But there is no, there's, there's scant little information, and so of course, when there's scant little information, what do I do? I look deeper and I make more phone calls and I reach out to more people and I'm like, hey, what do you know? And so I was able to put together some information that I'm going to um, share with you here. So he had, you know, again, his, his uh, Harry Wexner has a very murky life. Uh, however, um, it is clear to me, having found this information, that Leslie Wexner has revised the family story. Uh, so one of the tidbits of interesting facts I obtained was from a distant relative of Wexner's. So this family, his family is connected to Wexner's family. They all came from Russia and they've been putting together their uh, historical information. And they too were interested. So. Basically, he told me that they had discovered that um, Harry had gotten into trouble while in Russia. They didn't know if it was theft. They thought it was for theft. But, you know, it could be it could have been murder because he was only 13 when the family emigrated into the United States. But by the time he is 13, he, he, he has committed a crime in Russia, which I thought, wow, okay, so he's a juvenile offender. Um, so, and it would sort of be consistent with what I discovered of his brother, Mayor, who was arrested several times in the United States. So that seemed like, okay, it seems like uh, these, this family, um, they, you know, they were going out and taking things that did not belong to them. So, but as I said, Harry was 13 when he left um, Russia with his family. They arrived in Chicago and then they moved to Missouri before settling in Ohio. Uh, Harry never learned how to write and found work in a department store as a package wrapper from where he is alleged to have risen among the ranks to manager. The 1940 census shows that when Les was five, the family was living at 525 Armour in Kansas City in Jackson, Missouri. They lived a rather nomadic life, moving from city to city. And the, 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 the explanation was that um, Harry needed to find work. Well, was that truly the case, right? Because as I saw when I looked through Meyer's life, he moved from city to city because he was in trouble with the law. So it raised the question to me, did Harry move from city to city not to get a better job because apparently he was only working in, within a, a department store. So that's something you can, you can do in whatever city and state you happen to live in. But were they moving from place to place? 
because perhaps he, he too was getting in trouble with the law. So that is a question that I raise. And if you have any information at all about Harry Wexner and his life before uh, he dies in 1975, I would love for you to leave it in the comment section and, so that I can contact you or you know follow the information that you leave me. Um, so uh, Wexner, Leslie Wexner claimed that the family uh, put down roots in 1951 in Ohio once they opened their store named Leslie's after him and at the time he was 14. And this was uh, in initially put forth into the public domain in the 1986 New York Times article. So we know that is something that comes from a New York Times article in 1986 is going to be a public relations um, job uh, paid for by one Leslie Wexner. So, um, but however, what we do know is that Wexner did not do well in school. Um, his classmates recall that he rarely socialized. Um, one of his, uh, one of the things that Wexner has said and has said often is that his parents had no money. Well, this kind of seems to be a little disingenuous because they paid tuition for him to attend this exclusive and wealthy high school in the enclave of Bexley, Ohio. So they could have sent him to the local high school, which was free, the public school, but they chose not to. They paid to send him to this private high school. They also paid for him to attend Ohio State University. And they also paid for him to attend a law school, which he did not finish. Um, I didn't find... Um, information on what Wexner may have looked like or been as a boy. I mean, when his classmates said that he was not very sociable, I remembered a story um, someone I met uh, through Twitter told me once, and she's a member of a, the royal family, but she's not you know, a wealthy member of the royal family. And when I say royal family, I mean, uh, a, a cousin of, let's say, of Prince Andrew, a distant cousin of Prince Andrew, she said that in the late 1980s, uh, Leslie Wexner invited her to a dinner party. Epstein was there with Eva Dubin, and that she she uh, remembered him as a schlub. That's what she called him, and it just, you know, it was something that made me chuckle. Uh, because I thought, well, you know, the royals, whether you have money or not, they certainly know how to um, how to sniff out someone from the low, lower classes, right? So, and uh, so then I sort of uh, thought to myself, oh, okay, that that tells me. Once I delved a little bit further into Wexner's life, uh, that Wexner was from the other side of the tracks. Right, so that Bella, his mother, who I dedicate, you know, I devoted a whole chapter to, and you know, again, it'll be in my book, and it's part of my newsletter, and I, I won't go into Bella's life here, but Bella uh, came from uh, a more stable family background. Her parents had, you know, they were not suffering. It, it, where they needed to go steal money that seems to me that Bella's family was a, a more affluent, although they were not rich, they were better able to handle life in the United States when they made their move. Um, so anyway, uh, what interest, I, I did find uh, through somebody uh, connected to me on Twitter, a photo which again, I include in my book, uh, Creating Webster, the only known photo of Leslie Wexner's father. Um, and he, he doesn't look like a, he doesn't look like a, a nice man. And he's got the same deep set eyes that Leslie Wexner has. He has the same eyebrows, the same um, hairline, 
but he's, you know, you can tell he's, he's, um, you can tell that he's just not a happy man and, and he, he looks weary and he looks uh, heavy and not the kind of heavy that you become when you're, you know, a lot of people who become wealthy become a little, somewhat overweight, uh, but there's also the uh, sort of like a, a more flaccid type of being overweight that happens to poor people. And that is that is how um, Harry Wexner appears in this only photo that I was able to get of him. Um, so what I discovered was that, um, I'm going to skip a couple of things. And again, you'll get this information. It took a lot of information. So it's, I can't give you everything in, in one podcast. But um, what I do want to say is that uh, Leslie Wexner's uh, time at school is something that we have not really been uh, told much about. Um, and in fact, you know, I don't have that in front of me, but I am going to see if I can find it because I'm in the middle of this podcast and I opened up the wrong notes. Can you believe that? And the reason that happens, I'll share with you, uh, as embarrassing as it is, is that I go through uh, doing this uh, these chapters that and some of these end up, as I said, in the newsletter, <clears throat> I write them over and over and over again. So I find new information. I include new information and then I update it and then they become separate files. But let's talk about Ohio State University, which is where Harry and Bella sent Leslie Wexner. Uh, Ohio State University, which I did not know, uh, was a military um, a military school. So, in 1917, the War Department enlisted um, schools of military aeronautics. How do you say this word? Aero aeronautics. You, you know. All right, I think you know what I'm saying. Uh, at six universities, and Ohio State was among these until 1960, com compulsory military education existed. So Wexner served in the Air National Guard as part of his studies. Did you ever hear that Leslie Wexner had gone, had be, was a military guy? I know that when I came upon this information, I was totally like, whoa. And I didn't know this about the War Department in Ohio State. So then, you know, I know that Michelle Rickless, who is my abuser's father, also went to Ohio State when he, he came from uh, the UK after the, the war. And he was somehow snuck into Ohio State University. And so it became almost very clear to me. Um, and of course, Michelin Rickless, who is the founder of Rapid American Corporation, he is now deceased. Um, he was enlisted by NASA to design and make the spacesuits worn by Neil Armstrong, who is another Ohio native. And now I understand why Neil Armstrong is an, uh, you know, became an astronaut because he also was part of this uh, uh, sort of government-sponsored state. I mean, the, the, the government kind of was running this state. It's just, I did not know this. Um, and so that Wexner had gone into the National Guard uh, came as a surprise to me, but then I realized, I see. So he served in the military. He's from Ohio State that is very, very connected to uh, the US government. In fact, we have about five approximately five uh, former presidents of the United States who were part of this, uh, who all came from Ohio. All right, so then the story is that he goes on to establish the limited uh, and uh, by 1966, according to one of my sources, 
um, he had a couple of stores. So theoretically, he opens his first store borrowing $5,000 from his aunt. He then goes to the bank and borrows another five. And then immediately doesn't open one store. He goes and he opens a second one and he goes to the bank where one of his friends from school is the bank owner or the bank manager. And he becomes in, indebted to them for over a million dollars. The whole financial initial financial analysis, the, the little that I was able to do of how Leslie Wexner went from borrowing $5,000 from his aunt, allegedly, right, according to him, to suddenly opening not one store, but several, uh, and then becoming, uh, being able to borrow over a million dollars. That's back in the 60s. That's unheard of. I mean, that seems like an awful lot of money for somebody of that age with parents who are not wealthy, uh, unless he was somehow uh, of use to someone who was uh, in, a, in a powerful position. So some, uh, I did have a, a, a contact who I'm not going to name because he does not wish to be named, who told me that in 1966, Wexner was selected by powerful people in the mob to be who became his silent backers. Okay, that makes sense because we know by now the history of the mob as it pertains to how they work and have collaboratively worked with the CIA since before World War II, right? So when the CIA and the mob uh, use front people, they do they they select someone who does not have a felony uh and this is how they launder their dirty money they sort of can get control of what seemingly appears to be a legitimate business and they can access the highest levels of government um so you know he he then goes, uh, he does his first uh, public offering uh, for the limited in 1969 on Wall Street. And then in 1975, oh, and I should say that his father, Harry Wexner, never learned to read, he never learned to write. So he's basically illiterate. He becomes the chairman of this public company, this publicly owned company without being able to read or write. He's a chairman and he it's a position that he stays in until 1975. Personally, if I had money to invest in, in a, a company, a publicly traded company on Wall Street, I would always, it would just be my inclination. And I think those of you who own stock in companies, you do some due diligence on the chairman, you find out who the CEO is, you try to do some research, but it's interesting to me that, okay, well, his mother is basically whispering into Leslie Wexner's ear and his father who can't read is the chairman. So something already, even if we don't know anything about his role with Jeffrey Epstein, something is definitely off with the whole company, the limited. Um, so in, in any event, his father dies in 1975. Uh, there is no, there is no obituary on him. So that that's you know layers of secrecy, layers of secrecy. Uh, so Wexner and his aging mother Bella live together in this 8,000 square foot Tudor mansion just behind the governor's house in Bexley, Ohio. Uh, I, again, in the book, you will find a map of Leslie Wexner's house at the time. It is right behind the governor's uh, residence, uh, literally right behind it. And it, I, I included it in not just the newsletter that I shared with my subscribers on Tuesday, but I put this in the book because it's one of the chapters in the Creating Epstein book. I put it there because it kind of it creeped me out. It was sort of like a visual image of the term shadow government. Um, 
at, at his house is basically much grander, much larger uh, than the house of the governor of of the state. So um, there, I go into a lot of information. Some information uh, you may have heard about, but, but perhaps not in detail in, in the way that I describe it here. Um, the Arthur Shapiro uh, murder, the fact that Jeffrey Epstein was implicated in that murder, despite the fact that he is alleged to have met Epstein after uh, 1985, when Shapiro was murdered, uh, it, that date keeps changing. Sources say it's in 1986. Other people say it's 1987. But there was enough uh, information discovered uh, through a leaked report uh, to suggest that Jeffrey Epstein was in Leslie Wexner's life. In, in 1985 and perhaps before that, um, the other thing that became, that I pointed out was that uh, Epstein was thought to be uh, a person of interest, obviously in uh, Shapiro's murder, but he was also a person of interest in the murder of Robert Maxwell. So um, I go into that, I go into the fact that um, Months before uh, Robert Maxwell dies, uh, sometime in July, uh, Galen Maxwell is traveling on Jeffrey Epstein's private plane. Um, and then, of course, I go into uh, Stephen Hoffenberg being arrested in 1993 by the FBI in Arkansas after Towers Financial was outed as being a Ponzi scheme. What, what's interesting to me is always that Hoffenberg, look, I'm gonna be very clear with you. I, I, I believe very little of what Hoffenberg says, okay? I just believe very little of what anyone who has made uh, their life, you know, I mean, he was, he was a criminal. There is some suspicion on my part because the government, uh, the CIA and also Mossad, they have historically, we can look at the Robert Vesco situation, which is, I think, a continuation of this whole Epstein thread. But the, the, the Mossad and the CIA, who, again, have worked collaboratively, have historically used uh, Ponzi schemes. And I'm going to say the name, Robert Vesco, okay, who, again, was connected to Michelle and Rickless, who disappeared. And... It was a CIA connect, connected operation where they, it's one of the ways that they uh, got money for their covert operations. Um, so in my opinion, the Stephen Hoffenberg uh, Ponzi scheme that he hired Jeffrey Epstein to become a consultant because as he tells it, he recognized a criminal mastermind. In my opinion, this is also connected to intelligence. Now. If Hoffenberg hired Epstein in 1987, knowing that he was a criminal mastermind, Wexner had to have known the same thing because Wexner gave him power of attorney in 1991, the same year that Robert Maxwell dies. Leslie Wexner hands power of attorney to Jeffrey Epstein. I pose the question in my book, in this chapter, whether or not uh, Leslie Wexner gave power of attorney to uh, Jeffrey Epstein for the same reason that um, the CIA uses front people, right? Is it for plausible deniability? Is it so that perhaps Jeffrey Epstein can go out there and commit various crimes financial or otherwise, using that money, and that if it's traced back to Wexner, he can say, well, I, I didn't know, he did it. And, and of course, my suspicion, and I think at this point, it's more than a suspicion, is that the, it was, again, it's a funnel, so that the money really came in from 
the covert operation and therefore through one or two intelligence agencies so that, that then Epstein can do whatever he wants, which he did. He had a child trafficking operation with Glenn Maxwell. And then uh, Wexner can do what he did uh, when he stepped down from his position at the limited resigned as uh, the CEO chairman and said, oh my goodness, clutching his pearls. I did not know that he was a, such a depraved individual. Uh, there's a lot more information that I go into. I go into who Abigail Koppel is. I, I think nobody has done a deep dive on her. I, I do. And I go into the Fox Coat Estate and all of the creepy stuff that apparently goes on in there and, and and you know that is reminiscent of Stanley Kubrick's eyes wide open um in any event uh this is a preview of my book creating Epstein and I certainly hope that uh for, for the time being I will say uh I am keeping that book on my website so kirbysummers.com and you can just, you know, look at the menu and pre-order it because uh, you'll be the first to get it. People will start receiving their copies in about a week or so. I would say a week to 10 days from today, which is April the 7th. Um, and if you have not become a member of my Epstein Project newsletter, do so. Subscribe. Um, it supports my work so that I can do deep dives like this, which you know, if, if you know that other people are doing deep dives like this, share that information with me uh, in the comments section, because I really don't know of anyone who's going into Leslie Wexner's backyard, so to speak, or into his closets and pulling out those skeletons that I think we all really need to see uh, a little clearer uh, so that we can understand what, what this trafficking network was about, how it impacts our life because it's all about propaganda. It's all about selecting politicians that work for them. So in essence, a puppet government, right? Um, and what we're now calling and what really was coined about half a century ago, the new world order, which we're in the middle of. Uh, so with that, <laughs> I think I covered a lot of material more than I thought I would. I'm gonna ask you again to like the video, subscribe. I'm gonna thank you again for being amazing. And I'm gonna hope that you have a really good day. Okay, talk soon, bye.